I um, am pleased to uh, again welcome us back to the break. I, I must confess that I was, that as I did earlier, I, I thanked, uh, uh, I thanked, uh, uh, you know, several people when I when I started, and um, it's it's very important to to think about um, uh, raise challenge to us in terms of thinking about um, the uh, ways in which the levers in which uh, businesses and private private sector can pull in order to improve population health. And I, for one, tremendously impressed with what this panel did in opening my eyes. All three of you, just a terrific, terrific job. I heard uh, Larry talk about good points about engagement of the potential of the private sector via, via re regional uh, rigorous commitments. Uh, and talk about social as well as financial outcomes and the alignment of those in terms of being important. I heard Mark talk about um, uh, the uh, uh, environment um, actually beyond the way we think about it in this roundtable in terms of its larger impacts on, you know, the viability of life on the planet. I, my words, not yours, but, uh, and how health plays into that and our formulation plays into that. And I thought the other thing that um, you said, Mark, that's, a, you know, very, potentially very useful is that triple bottom line for our companies in terms of, I believe you said environmental, social, and financial bottom lines. Is that right? Um, and I think uh, us promoting that in a way that uh, 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 as much as we can uh, in, in beyond uh, uh, in the work we do um, may be very useful. Uh, and Gary, I thought just a great. Uh, I love the the the, um, the uh, healthcare without harm sort of frame for the entire organization and talking about some very elegant examples of how healthcare can really be more responsible within uh, from the environmental sector. And I, there are many other ways I can think of beyond your examples about how we ought to be thinking about healthcare beyond harm. Healthcare is certainly very, very important, but we don't want it to be a net negative for the society. And I think I love that concept uh, and so forth. So let's uh, begin the uh, Q&A. And with a break, you know, breaks people's train of thought, but I don't want you to be, you know, shy about coming up and asking questions of this group because we have a, a period of time now where we can have those questions. And I see you, uh, Bobby Milstein, coming to the microphone. I will remind you um, that I would like you all to identify yourselves in your organization, even though uh, I just identified you, Bobby, but go <laughs> That's ahead. That's fine. Bobby Milstein from Rethink Health and a member of the Roundtable. Um, my question is for Mark, and, and I, was, I was fascinated by the progression from looking internally at your own footprint toward the larger um, uh, sort of global view of a, of a collective blueprint. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about the internal processes within Dow on, on when you collectively may have felt that you were getting out of step with the rest of the uh, industry competitors and, and whether that meant having to lead a, a consortium of other people to reinvent the industry at a sort of broader level and what that calculus was as you began to position yourselves um, not just as a competitor in a, in a market but really reinventing the marketplace itself. Okay, we're on with the microphone now. Thank you. So I, I think the nature of your question was how did Dow decide to develop the 2025 goals in the way that we did around the blueprint for sustainability? And it was really a progression as we looked at how the company was being transformed into the company that we really wanted it to be and the company that society is going to expect us to be in the future to be a positive force for good in society as well as what our employees were expecting. And specifically, as we looked at the next generation approach to sustainability, um, which was, for my definition, what was going to happen after the 2015 sustainability goals were finished, we began that process in 2009 with a long-range visioning process. Um, we have a Sustainability External Advisory Council that's been in place since 1992, which is about 10 academic government NGO leaders that advise our senior management in a series of semi-annual meetings. They started with our CEO and his staff in the fall of 2009 to envision what would a sustainable society look like as well as what our place in a sustainable society would be 
out in Dow's 200th birthday, which is the year 2097. So looking way out, and of course it's impossible to predict all the technology and societal changes, but that at least gives you a framework for thinking beyond ourselves and beyond all of the assets that are in the ground and thinking long term and then bringing that back to what do we do now. And in 2013, one of the critical things that happened was our senior executives said, we really need to get employee engagement and employee input as well as input from our customers. And we did extensive interviews across our company with our employees to find out what kind of company do they want to be leading, particularly looking at our so-called millennial population. What kind of company did they want to inherit as they were leading? And that drove us towards a lot of the thinking that you're seeing now from us around not only taking care of our footprint and not only helping customers with our handprint, but also forging this blueprint for human sustainability. Did that get at your question? Yes, in, in, in many ways. The, 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 the one step further is then, and how does that relate, how does that position Dow relative to the other people in your market? And, and how, um, to what extent do other um, companies in this same sector need to align and, and work towards some of those same visions? So is it really just a competitive move for Dow? To, um, to have a better um, alignment with internal priorities and workforce direction and values? Um, or does it also entail simultaneous changes in the market as a whole? I think it entails simultaneous changes in the market as a whole. And I would give credit to some of our competitors for thinking along the same kinds of lines as well. So it's not just us that's thinking this way, although there are there, there is a gradient, a, a, a distribution, as, as you would imagine with any of these things. But it has to be a transformation, really, of not only the industry, but also of society in general. So that's why we talk about redefining the role of business and society. Thanks. Paula. Hi, Paula Lance from George Washington University. Uh, I want to springboard from, from Bobby's question and, and ask all the panelists, and thank you all to, um, for coming today and sharing your wonderful perspectives and, and what you're doing in your organizations with us. Um, I'm imagining that this wasn't a smooth journey, certainly for Dow and probably for the other organizations as well. Um, and I'm wondering if you would be um, willing to be honest and frank with us a bit about what were some of the, the conversations and tensions on your boards uh, and among leadership as you, you know, have this strategic vision that's different um, and, and moving towards it. Were there naysayers? Were there, you know, people saying, no, this isn't, you know, what what we should be doing in the 21st century or you know again if you can um be honest and tell us some of the you know the the debates and tensions that you had in in all of your journeys i think that'd be very instructive for us yeah good question and for sure i had some i don't know about you guys but um uh in particular for me when i think back about um some of the early challenges one was just that we hadn't built any trust among any anyone in the community that we were going to be working with. And that's that's everyone from advocates to private sector to corporations. And um, I think everyone was fairly suspicious of what we were going to bring to the table. Um, advocates wondering if we were going to be providing quick, easy wins and, you know, kind of not having substantive agreements. Um, Private sector, having gotten used to, in some cases, getting beat up um, and uh, not wanting to put themselves in a position, um, in particular in the food space, I think that was part of it. And so we worked very hard in the beginning um, as we established ourselves, number one, to be very clear about what we were going to do and what we were not going to do. The most important thing that we were not going to do was get involved in public policy. There are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, there are organizations that do a terrific job on that. Um, and we wouldn't provide extra value necessarily. And number two, if we're going to be able to develop trust with um, private sector and advocates, um, being on Capitol Hill and taking positions is really not going to be helping. So we really um, honed in our work on voluntary um, commitments that were significant and meaningful but had accountability. And so that was, that was one of the biggest issues I faced. Um, the, and, and I saw as... Once that trust became built, 
um, it got much smoother and um, much easier to work with everyone. I would say um, around uh, sustainability issues in the healthcare sector, uh, initially, um, Kaiser was an early adopter, and, and after them, or in addition to them, it was the uh, Catholic faith-based institutions that had a core mission um, that extended well beyond the four walls of the hospital to understand that they were caring for God's creation and they had a healing ministry. And so um, for a long time, it was those nonprofits. And when we were able to make a really strong business case that um, many of these sustainability uh, measures also saved lots of money. Um, that brought the investor-owned hospital systems uh, into the table because they, they weren't motivated before. And I think that the Affordable Care Act has been a game changer. Um, just the fact that we're, we're saying that healthcare has a responsibility to deal with population health um, and figure out what that means has brought everybody to the table. Um, because it started to change the incentive system for the entire enterprise of, of healthcare in America, and it's been a, a real game changer. And I think we're at the very early stages of what all that means, and this workshop is figuring that out with the private sector, but it's, it, it, that was the big changes for, for us. I think if I address the question briefly for industry as well as Dow in particular, you, you do have a, a gradient, a distribution of people who are thinking in a short-term way, um, but those people are being brought along by seeing the business case and seeing this triple bottom line of social benefit, environmental benefit, as well as economic benefit. Seems to me that uh, I detect in the first several questions here uh, an assumption, an unstated assumption behind the question, which is the perception that business is only in it for money and doesn't care about this stuff. Can you speak to the tension of that perception in between private enterprise and the uh, public health or the academic community? And, and uh, is, has that been a challenge for you? Is there an opportunity there? Is progress being made? I'd appreciate all three of your point of view on that. So if I, if I start off on that, I, I think this is part of the reason that we're calling to redefine the role of business in society because the, the Milton Friedman model of, you know, business is just out there to make money and then you have philanthropy to take care of all the social issues is really not a model that's going to be functional for us going forward as a human society. It, it doesn't work. So we have to reinvent what we think about when we think about capitalism. Um, capitalism as if the planet matters, capitalism as if people matter. Um, we're heading in the wrong direction on a lot of those issues which will erode trust um, for business and at the end of the day businesses run on trust um, society runs on trust um, and we we can't cultivate that by just being out for ourselves so I think there's a there's a redefining of business that's going on here very broadly and I think we can tap into that and create the kind of collaborations that'll move us forward to a sustainable society others so what we did was we just said, okay, yeah, we agree. Profitability is, I mean, these, this is what corporations are, um, that's their fiduciary duty to their shareholders. Um, let's just go with it. Let's try to help them be profitable. Um, and f like in our case, one of the things that we really needed to do was try to change consumer demand because consumer demand, you know, when we first started this work was not as high for healthier products and um, so you saw the first lady out there doing a lot to really connect with everyone from the community to corporate leaders to others to try to raise kind of awareness of some of these issues and um, that kind of led I think that was a critical part of leading to consumer movement consumer demand and we had sort of the win with the Millennials coming as well at the same time so we've just gone with the fact that hey, we want, we want this to be profitable. We understand the need to make profit. That's what we're about. Um, and it's kind of worked well. If we had not had the demand, I don't know if that strategy would have worked as well. Yeah, and I, I guess I would say uh, on the, for, the, for the marketplace in healthcare, um, we also think that we, it was a demand-driven approach that if we could create enough demand among enough of the healthcare sector that the, the supply chain would respond. And if so, if people are demanding uh, safer food, uh, cleaner energy, 
safer products, then ultimately the supply chain in, in healthcare and then the broader supply chain is going to respond. And so that demand-driven approach uh, has worked. And our point of view is there is no economy in the 21st century that's not sustainable um, because we can't afford the enormous public health and environmental um, uh, impacts of an economy that isn't sustainable. That's just become obvious. Um, and on the hospital side, um, you know, as long as we were, uh, as long as we were rewarding um, healthcare to do more procedures and do more tests and do more interventions, you know, it, it's it's the, it's this, those those uh, incentives are out of alignment with prevention and with saving money and with population health goals. So whatever changes that already started to be made around the incentive structure and financing in healthcare, we need to go a lot more. Uh, down that road to to incentivize um, prevention. Obviously, that's much cheaper, and healthcare shouldn't be occupying 18% of the entire <coughs> economy. It's too big. It needs to be shrunk, um, and it needs to. We need to push out healthcare uh, and health outside of the these acute care facilities, out into the community where people live and go to school. I think here was next, and then over here. So I can't quite see who you sure. are. Sure. Thank, Thank you. My name is Victor. Ruben, I'm the Vice President for Research at PolicyLink. I'll, I'll be speaking later um, on community development. Gary, thank you for the work you do and the explanation of it. Your association of the activity with uh, the term anchor institutions brought to mind other aspects of that. In other words, hospitals, urban hospitals, big medical centers, and the universities they're often attached to, but are uh, think of and themselves as anchor institutions in an economic sense as well, so that the procurement issues are not only the ones you described, but also about supporting uh, business development by minority-owned, women-owned, locally-owned businesses. Uh, the uh, issues of local hiring and job training and connection to local economic development are huge, and these are often in low-income urban neighborhoods where the land use issues are questions of contested terrain over decades and the institutions have, I would say, overall fortunately been exhibiting a lot more um, conscious uh, practices and attitudes than they did in decades past. So there's a whole a movement towards more progressive anchor institution strategies evidenced by the work of the Democracy Collaborative and what they call the anchor dashboard where not only the institutions but the local players, government and nonprofits and community, agree on a common set of goals and metrics for what would constitute progress. So I guess two related questions. One is the kind of work that you're doing related in practice in the, in the way in which you see the hospitals acting or the, your own organization's work with those economic and community development goals. And since this is actually very local, whether you're looking at Baltimore or Philadelphia or Boston or any of the big cities where the anchors are dominant players. Can you give some lessons like the ones you closed with specifically about local partnerships? Uh, because I think you handled the sort of philosophical and, if you will, national issues and what the partnerships are in a very good way. But I, if there's a local angle to it that you can speak to, that'd be very helpful. Sure. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'll give you. An, I'll start with the example. Um, so, uh, Gunderson Health System in in La Crosse, Wisconsin, um, has become the first system in the country to become energy independent. Um, so they produce more renewable energy uh, than they consume fossil fuels. It's pretty amazing, and they've done it with community partnerships. So they partnered with Organic Valley on a on a wind project. They partnered with a local brewery to take their waste heat and then run turbines and run energy. They partnered with the local landfill to create methane gas. Um, they have partnered on all these community energy projects that not only power their own facilities but begin to help the community of La Crosse and other communities move toward renewable energy. So they see themselves as not only addressing their own energy security but that of the community and that's a really lovely example. Um, on the anchor strategy, in fact, we're working with the Democracy Collaborative uh, and Emerald Cities and Kaiser Permanente and Dignity Healthcare and 
uh, University of California in Berkeley that's about to expand its campus to Richmond, California. Uh, so we're looking at Oakland and Richmond and seeing that within these large, large employers and, and, and healthcare systems and university, how can they redirect their supply chains to actually create jobs, uh, green jobs, healthy jobs in Oakland and Richmond? How can they um, move their supply chains to support uh, a, a food uh, procurement that would um, buy, for example, buy a healthier food, um, process it perhaps in a kitchen in Oakland, uh, hire people that could then deliver it to patients in their homes who maybe have had a heart event and we don't want them to come back to the hospital, they're pre-diabetic. And so to create this whole righteous kind of health and wealth creation strategy that actually achieves population health goals. Those are some of the kind of strategies we're, we're looking at. So even though I live in Oakland, I, I didn't plant that question. I actually, uh, I have heard a little about it, but not nearly as much, so thank you. Do the others of you want to respond to that, how you handle the local sort of uh, aspect of uh, uh, your operations, whether it be bad I mean, or... I'll, I'll tell you from our perspective, it's been harder because we've actually, we've had a lot of interest in local communities and states that have wanted to um, duplicate our strategy and we've had a number, a lot of discussions with them and um, our process with the accountability, it's really hard to drive that in an efficient way at the local level. Um, and so we really have kind of stuck national so far. From a local perspective with Dow over the last decade, we pioneered a way of relating to our major communities that we call contributing to community success. We started with a third party diagnostic at 14 of our major locations where we went out into the community and said, okay, what is your definition of success? Um, we'd already had community advisory panels that talked to us about how we were operating our plants and interface with the local mayors and that sort of thing. But um, this really said, okay, what in Argentina, what in Texas, what in Zhangjiang, China meant, what, what, what meant community success to you? And then started working on things like education programs and, and health programs in the community. Um, and it was tremendously successful for us. Thank you. Right over here. Um, Kathy Bozzi, who is a member of the round table and also uh, the chief health officer for the Dow Chemical Company. Um, you've already been moving into the territory of my question, but I'll relay uh, this space. As we've been working through the round table, one of the things we've uh, continued to emphasize is that the magnitude of the need and the challenge to advance population health will absolutely require the engagement of all sectors of society. And in order to accomplish that, um, we, we just need that entire um, cross-sector uh, engagement. And somehow uh, the, the concepts of collaboration and partnerships to create that, that sometimes things can be accomplished by one individual sector, but uh, oftentimes it's, it, the, the greater power is through getting multiple sectors together or multiple partners together to uh, advance something. And uh, Gary, you just mentioned a couple of great examples uh, about how many different partners were involved in that Gund Gunderson effort. So it wasn't like Gunderson by themselves said, hey, we want to be uh, energy efficient here, <laughs> but they had to get so many parties. And I guess, um, Given that seems to be both the opportunity and the, the uh, path that has found success, can you give any other aspects of your thinking about collaborations and where those might go in the future from any of the speakers? And I do have a second question since maybe this one's been uh, covered a bit. Uh, and that's really around the business case. And we were talking about you know, is business just in it for uh, profits or whatever? But part of it is, I think, in understanding what all creates success for the business community. I mean, ultimately, they can't thrive if the community around them is failing. Um, a, a hospital can't thrive if there's no good paying jobs in the community anymore and, and all kinds of things. So um, it's a wider angle 
on the business case, not strictly the, the direct sale of particular products or services, but this bigger picture of what's involved in the business case of that relationship between business and society. So collaborations, first question, second, is the broader picture of the business case. I'll start on the collaboration. I, I, it's interesting in, in, in some communities where we're trying to build that kind of partnership, having some independent and trusted third party is kind of critical. So in Cleveland, um, where there's been fantastic collaboration uh, to build a more sustainable local economy um, between Case Western and Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals, it was the Cleveland Foundation that was the convener that pulled people together, in some cases competitors, to say, you know, we actually have a broader mission here that we want you to collaborate on. Um, in this anchor strategy in, in Oakland and, and Richmond, it's actually the, the, the nonprofit organizations who are the conveners, um, along with uh, the California Endowment um, and other foundations that are bringing, in some cases, collaborators, in some cases, competitors in the same healthcare market to the table and, and a whole bunch of other partnerships. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's called the backbone organization or, or some other, I think that's what, what Larry's organ, the PHA plays that um, in, this, in this obesity space. So I think that's a pretty critical um, component is, is that independent third party trusted convener. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and I would add a lot of the things that we do are kind of one on one, you know, us with a partner and we determine what we're going to do. But increasingly, you're, we're seeing more multi stakeholder collaborations, which um, are often more complicated to pull off. Um, so the F and V one that I showed you has a lot of non traditional, the world WWE, which is wrestling, um, uh, philanthropy. Um, it has produce companies, which you would, you would assume, um, has restaurants. It's just a very different sort of thing. Um, and everyone's coming in at it with kind of the same overall goal, but slightly different kind of things that they want to achieve out of it. And so it's a balancing act trying to make sure that the initiative can sort of try to hit that for the people who are supporting it. The other kind of interesting one is, um, I alluded to it, it's called Let's Move Active Schools. And um, the purpose of the program is to change the physical inactivity epidemic in schools so that we find champions in schools, we train them, we provide them with access to grants and resources so that they can um, make their schools more physically active and sort of change the culture of that school. And it's, a, it's, it's quite an extensive program. Um, we have about 15,000 schools out of 100,000 have signed up so far. Um, but what we've done with the collaboration is we brought in everyone from Nike to Reebok to um, groups like mine, and each of us has used our particular expertise in one particular role. So it's been a very interesting kind of puzzle that's come together. Um, the Alliance for Healthier Generation is already in schools in how to train them. Shape America works as the physical educators, and so they're taking on that role. We do the collaboration kind of role. And so when they work and people can really use their special expertise, that's, that's a really effective one. Um, on the business case, I would agree. The business case is a lot more than profit. I just think that profit is, if you can speak the language, that's easier. But it's been so interesting to me to see um, how aggressively some companies have used the work with PHA or when the First Lady is involved with their employee base to talk about what they've done and, the, and how proud the employees have been. And so that I think is really important to have a, a proud employee base. Um, also, and I think this is more difficult, but the fact that one out of two Americans will be obese by the year 2030 if nothing changes, that um, is gonna have a really big impact on the ability of certain jobs to be filled. Um, but that's harder to kind of only some companies are really kind of looking down and seeing that pass. So I think I try to push that, but I think that's sometimes more difficult. So trying to find other ways um, that companies can see the success from doing this profit is, is important, but I think there are other, other things that are important too. So building on what Larry and Gary have said here and, and piggybacking off the business case and what Larry just said about the, the, the future scenario that sometimes people don't buy into that necessarily. They can't grab onto that. 
that has been a way that we've tried to look at the business case within Dow that has been effective sometimes, not as effective other times. But, you know, net present value is a key metric for business. And the, the problem is that a lot of times, if you're not careful about it, you can just unwittingly project a past that really no longer exists into the future. So 10 years from now, in places where we use a lot of water that are water stressed, the price of water cannot be um, just a, a zero or something that's minimal. You have to project a price of water into the net present value calculation. And talking to finance people about how to do that is a critical skill that needs to be done to, to build the business case. So building future scenarios that are very different than the present and very different than the past, I think, is, is important. Um, on collaboration, I think some of the things that we've found is it's really important um, to drive a mutual understanding of what each collaborator is going to get out of this and, and try to make that explicit and drive to not just the first level of what you prepared to say, but the second level and the third level. And sometimes this gets into dinners and drinks and that sort of thing where you're really casual and you're saying, what are we really getting out of this from an organizational standpoint? as well as what the personal actors are, are, are going to be looking to get out of it as well. And then to create a common language. Um, in a lot of the collaborations that we've been engaged in, that's been a key issue, is figuring out when you say this word, it means this to you, but it means this to me. Um, with our collaboration with the Nature Conservancy over the last five years on valuing ecosystem services, um, we've talked about biodiversity, we've talked about ecosystems, we've talked about ecosystem services. Um, those terms have academic meanings, but they have a lot of different meanings to a lot of different people. And an NGO and an academic organization and a business will think about them from different perspectives, and it's important to come to a common language. Gary. Yeah, just one thing so, on the business case. It's kind of... And quickly, too, because I'm going to get the rest oh, of Oh, there it is. Um, quick thing is, uh, you know, it's what's in the business case. So um, we approach a, a lot of the hospitals in the country around um, their use of fossil fuels, in particular coal. And they said, well, look, we're getting, you know, nine cents per kilowatt hour for energy from coal. We said, well, uh, what about the health costs? Is that in part of the nine cents per kilowatt hour? And so we developed a tool with the EPA and DOE and said, for your every every kilowatt hour used, these are the these are the direct health impacts. Uh, related to your use of coal, here's the broader societal impact. So that nine cents isn't really nine cents. It's nine cents plus all these other asthma cases and respiratory diseases. And so the business case changes when you start to incorporate the social impacts and the health impacts uh, of, of a particular business practice. And I think that's something that is, we're still at a very early stage of doing that in our society, of saying these are the full costs of this economy that's based on, on some of these dangerous inputs. That's well, I, the business case, too. I would editorialize here as the moderator that I think this is a critically important point, is not only the way in which you're trying to look at the business case through making the sophisticated modeling, but by the fact that you know, private industry is doing that, is finding the sophisticated ways to incorporate the other bottom lines, if you will, the social uh, and the environmental bottom lines into the cost of doing business. And um, that is a tremendously significant, uh, at least I think, uh, well, I'll interject that. But I want to go to Pamela for her question here before we come so down to the end of our time. that health impact question is for Mark primarily. It's, um, so Dow is a multinational company, right? right? And so there are international requirements for at least oil and gas, and I'm not sure about other companies to do a health impact assessment or environmental health impact right. assessment by by the WHO and other and the US Bank I think or the international banking organization right, exactly. right. and is that something that Dow uh, has done gets involved with do you think it has any power do you what's your impression of the effectiveness of those requirements yeah, so we've been doing environmental impact assessments on our projects for a really long time. We welcome those kinds of um, principles and, uh, and, and 
in oh, structures. And, well, okay, so the health impact assessment is a new tool that's being used in more and more of our projects as we go forward. We've been more focused on the environment in the past, but moving more towards the health impacts. So I remember as we looked at a, at a project where we would take sugar cane and move it to ethanol and then into polyethylene, we not only looked at the environmental impacts, but also the health impacts of what we were doing and seeing some positive things, but also seeing some things that we needed to mitigate. Was that a requirement or that was your motivation? There was both. We figured it would be a requirement in the future, and so we figured it would be better to get ahead of that as opposed to having somebody come back and say, well, gee, you know, you didn't do that. Because we have to think that when we put a facility in, the, in place, it's going to be there for decades. And so this is what's kind of difficult for us is we have to project out what people are going to expect of us into the future and then try to do that today. Okay. So uh, let me uh, close with this question. Um, the, uh, the other thing that I think is, uh, is really uh, a takeaway for me is how sophisticated the thinking of the private sector and businesses around this, uh, these health impacts, at least uh, the, these leading elements of the private sector. Um, so when you think about all the things that we've heard so far on this panel, uh, how many of them are driven by regulation or law? And we know that regulation law plays an important role in setting standards. So I would like you to talk a little bit about the relationship of what you're doing on a voluntary basis, a, you know, a basis of you think it's the right thing to do, you know, the business objectives, and the relationship between the regulatory. Although our panel wasn't about that, I think it would be very useful for this conversation and this audience to begin to break down the stereotype that regulation or law is one way or private sector is another way. It's, it's obviously much more sophisticated than that, I think, anyway. So I'm injecting a little of my own uh, you know, belief into this, but uh, would you comment on that? So I'll go ahead and start with that and then invite Larry and Gary to make some comments. Um, from an industry perspective, we welcome smart regulation. We, we need everybody firing on all cylinders in government, in academia, in NGOs, civil society, and in industry to solve the great sustainability challenges that are ahead of us. And regulation is going to be a key part of that. What we want to do is be at the table to be able to say, here's the way that we should go ahead and regulate this. Now, that creates the specter of distrust where some people are going to look at industry and just say, oh, the only reason you're at the table is to delay this or to maximize your own profits. Um, frankly, we need to earn the trust in, in some sectors because it, it's, it has been broken in some of the dialogues and we want to be a part of restoring that trust. But what we have to get to is a place where we can put in place smart regulation. That's going to inspire confidence in society when government can say that we're on board with this, when industry can say this can be done. Um, I would hold up as a great example of having done that the Montreal Protocol. If you look at a problem that was discerned by academia um, and then we put together the framework that is actually solving that problem. And so in a sense we need the Montreal Protocol for population health. That would be one thought that I have. I, I would just say for us we've worked really hard to separate our work from work mm -hmm. that's you know pending regulation um, and we've avoided stepping into those areas um, because we haven't want to be we haven't want to be used as a place that you know well we did right. that so we don't do that um, and we're kept pretty honest about that by the advocacy community in Washington mm -hmm. um, so they're they're usually on top of us but that's not because you don't believe regulation has its place it's oh, because no. that's how you're effective that's that's yes. what no I'm 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 fine yeah. with regulation I, I I'm also um, you know I think regulation policy change we just also have to admit it's, it's happening a lot less now than it yeah. did 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, I would just add a, a couple of points. Uh, um, one is our experience is that the regulation um, comes after the market's already moved. So we, you know, there, in the end of the day, there were 25 states that passed regulations restricting mercury products, but by that time, uh, the healthcare sector had already said we're, we're moving and it created momentum, but the market had already moved. Um, on the flip side, uh, sometimes very 
strategic surgical kind of regulations can have a huge impact. Um, so in this space around population health, uh, we and many other groups worked with the Catholic Health Association and the IRS to change the way um, what would be allowable under community benefits for nonprofit hospitals so that uh, hospitals could use community benefits to support more upstream interventions around food systems and housing and other things that actually might impact um, population health and they approved that and so that has created at least a door opener mm -hmm. for taking this 12 billion dollars a year in community benefit expenditures and start moving those into projects that actually could address uh, and community health so that was a good one thank you so much join me in thanking this panel uh, I'd like the roundtable members to keep in mind this uh, as we as you think about a panel on businesses changing their practices to produce health, what you expected you might hear on this panel versus what you actually hear, heard. When we come to the end of the day and reflections, I'd like you to reflect some of that back because I thought we had a terrific panel. Thank you very much. Turn it back to Ray here.